So we are live. So hello and namaste everyone again. Uh, welcome to the session fourth of the online space workshop 2020 jointly organized by MSA Nepal and Orion Space. I am Saurabh Porel, your host for this fourth session. With me today we have Mr. Tom Wakinsha as a speaker, Mr. Jitin Thapa and Mr. Rakesh Chandra Prajapati as a participant. Let me introduce you to the Tom. So Tom is a founder, uh, founder and CEO of Alva Orbital. He'll be presenting about uh, getting pocket cubes on orbit cheaply, regularly, and reliably. So, uh, uh, Alva Orbital is only the the launch provider, uh, one and only launch provider for pocket cube satellites till now. So I'd like to hand over this session now to the Tom. So Tom, that to you. Thanks, Rav. Um, can you see my screen or? No, no, we can't. Okay, how do we do that? Let's see. So you can click share screen and then. Okay, share screen. Okay, two seconds. Yes, screen one. Share. Okay, does that work? Uh, this moment it's coming, I guess. Yeah, fine. Okay, let's press on this. Uh, all right, it's looking up for me. There we go. Can you see that okay? Yeah, it's fine. It's okay. Fantastic. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me uh, on your uh, online event. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and it's always fun to chat about pocubes and, and satellites and things like that. Um, so this is just sort of our sort of generic album presentation, um, you know, just basically a little bit of overview of where we are just now and what we've done. Um, and yeah, maybe we can just give you like background to the, the company and um, like why I'm doing it and hopefully what it means for people that want to get to space, you know, quickly, reliably and cheaply. Um, so this is, um, you know, the, the sort of mission slide of the company. Um, you know, really the game plan for the company is to, to build PolCubes. Um, so PolCubes are five centimeter cube satellites that are growing in popularity now um, across the space sector. Very niche, obviously, just now, but um, even in the last few years, it's really, really grown a lot. Um, and Albo is the first company to really become a kind of pocket only company and really double down on the concept that uh, Professor Twiggs came up with about 10 years ago. And um, yeah, essentially our mission statement is, uh, you know, our, our, our mission is to advance pocket cause. Our goal is to be the best pocket company in the world and for that to matter. Um, so Abu today is the largest pocket company in the world by some distance. If you go in pretty much any metric um, revenue, number of employees, you know, just, you know, rev, uh, whatever we turn over, um, sort of projects done sort of thing. So we're, we're definitely the biggest, um, but obviously we, we want other companies to succeed as well and other organizations. So it's, there's no, there's no point being only, the only company beyond 10 people in the community or industry, because that's really small. We want to propagate the standards um, and the concepts to as many people as possible and basically allow them to get on orbit and you know essentially become space-faring organizations like albas and um you know um a bunch of different things um particularly the miniaturization of technology and the standardization of interfaces has allowed people to do actually pretty useful things on orbit um and this is um a picture of unicorn 2a or sort of an older render and um we're looking at the imaging on that one obviously um, so the three-stage plan for Alba is pretty simple. Um, launch, launch clusters. So people might be familiar with um, our launch late last year, which was um, Alba Cluster 2, which actually ironically was our first launch. Um, and um, that went really successfully. Uh, we deployed six spacecraft in orbit. Um, and they were all uh, really happy, obviously. And um, we got a lot of people heritage for the first time. And uh, yeah, um, I'll come on to that in a second, but we developed our own deployers and we, we went through all the kind of crap that it takes to get, you know, people's satellites in orbit. And we learned the hard way how to do that. And um, really the point of launch clusters is to 
really um, demonstrate a reliable and repeatable path uh, that people can rely on essentially because we originally signed up for a launch broker in 2015 uh, and they still haven't flown that uh, launch and you know that's just really not acceptable to be honest in our opinion um, if you're trying to do anything if you if you want to be serious about anything run a business but run an organization run about a team you can't rely on people that are six years late so you know the goal for Alba launch is to go annually um and cluster three i'll talk about later on maybe um that's currently scheduled uh for q4 which is a year after the original launch cluster two and really we're trying to push super hard to go twice in a year um uh, so we're we're on track for that. Um, so that'll be really important because then people will know that you know there's going to be an annual bus service, and and once that happens, we'll we'll look to double down and, and increase the cadence as the demand grows. Um, so hopefully more demand, shorter wait times, more flights, and it will be cyclical. Uh, so therefore the experience will be a little bit better. Uh, platforms. So we designed and developed a platform called Unicorn. Uh, we've done Unicorn One. Now we're in Unicorn Two. Unicorn 2 is um, a big movement forward in Unicorn 1. It's uh, the most capable pod cube in the world by specs. Um, and really the, the game plan there for Alba is to try and demonstrate that you can build a really compelling platform that can service a number of uh, payloads. Um, so um, while it's great that people are flying pod cubes, uh, uh, essentially they start off pretty limited. You know, they, they don't have that much capability, they don't have that much power, they don't have that much, you know, or any pointing capability. Um, very low data rates, that sort of thing. So really, they kind of it's great to go cheap, but then also it needs to be useful and good. And that's kind of like where Unicorn comes in. Unicorn is really supposed to be sort of showing the world that you can build compelling pocket cubes and that um, it is possible to generate a lot of power to build an active ADCS to have a lot of payloads, volume, and, and mass relative to the the bus. Um, so that's really the point of 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 that. Um, and really, after that, we, you know, we're essentially servicing other customers there that are, are doing constellations or, or, or aspire to do constellations. But we also aspire to do some stuff for that ourselves. And you know, we're we're working on some stuff internally just now that's not really been announced. But um, you know, we're looking to um, eventually go into that world and and try and show that if you buy Unicorn for X, that you can generate X plus however many percent uh, revenue. So therefore, it's a no-brainer. You know, it's you know, it's a money maker, which is the game plan. Um, so 2019 was quite a good year for Alba, probably their best year ever, if I'm being honest. Um, which, uh, on, on a ter in terms of the achievement standpoint, we really certainly the second half of the year we really picked it up and we really we really blasted it. Um, and um, yeah, obviously the, the main talking point um, was we successfully integrated and launched six satellites into low Earth orbit. So it's currently five still in orbit. So you can go chat to most of them. Uh, they're mostly amateur and they have open protocols and things like that. Uh, so it's um, really great to see so many success stories um, coming from that launch. Um, in, in order to do that, uh, we had to do so many different things. Um, you know, we, we essentially have our own dedicated launch department now internally that handles, you know, sales and, and um, customer mission management and uh, integration and, and whatnot. Uh, so we had to spin that up. We had to set up a company in Germany, actually, as well, to help with uh, some of the paperwork aspects. We um, we also had to develop um, a new deployer. So we had Applepod V1, and Applepod V1 wasn't very good, if we're being honest. It was, it was very heavy. Um, and, and really, mass is the thing that matters most, um, mostly when you're, you're doing pod design. Uh, obviously, it has to function, um, but you really want to minimize the mass because you essentially have to buy so many kilograms, and you want to buy... It says so you want as many of those kilograms to be customer kilograms as possible. You don't want to have to spend a lot on overhead. So if your pod say weighed, you know, like four kilograms and you could only take two kilograms payloads, then you know you have to spend the money on four kilograms going up. Whereas um, something like Applepod V2, the, the ratio of of mass on the platform to mass of the customer is it's very low. So we have uh, probably the best in the industry in that 
that metric. Uh, and we've done that through a number of different ways and we'll come on and talk about that in a sec. But um, Avapod V2 really is, I'm pretty sure, the latest operational space qualified deployer in the world um, and um, uses a lot of kind of advanced sort of materials to, to do that and, and design techniques. So we really, we really show for that work perfectly in orbit. We, uh, we launched two unicorns as well into orbit. Uh, to Unicorn 2 satellites. Um, we announced, I think, about a few weeks ago that we had our first success on Unicorn. So that was really exciting. Um, so Unicorn obviously is our flagship platform and um, really, um, really sort of capable PolCube um, from our kind of specs perspective. Um, uh, we really chuffed that um, the customer reported success on that. Um, and yeah, the, the fourth point, um, we, we opened up a dedicated manufacturing uh, space, including separate clean room. So uh, I'm currently at Alba just now, as you can probably tell from the sign. Um, but we have, I think, about 125 square meters worth of office, meeting room, and uh, assembly production space. So Alba is actually quite, it's, it's grown a lot, our footprint really, in the last couple of years. Um, so that means that we're able to really do a lot of things on site that we maybe weren't able to do before. So we can do the full assembly and integration and many of the tests now as well. Um, and really that's what opening up the manufacturing space allowed us to do. It's a big investment. It's a big bet, but um, so far it's looking like a, a, a sort of really useful tool to help our customers, um, you know, get, get their satellites to good quality in our orbit. So, um, so I can talk about that more later on, but um, yeah, we, we have the full uh, clean room to, I think it's class 10,000 clean room. Um, we've got a uh, Helm's old cage, we've got a lot of the RF equipment for testing, we've got a lot of the sort of uh, rework solder equipment, microscopes, that sort of thing. So we, we're kind of kitted out now to, to build a decent cadence. Um, so yeah, so this is basically inside our clean room. Um, and, uh, yeah, essentially this is Albopod V2, um, with four of our customer satellites in it. So this is cluster two pod one. Uh, so from right to left, we have Creasy, uh, we have Smog P, got Fozza. Uh, so Julian, I think is doing a talk as well as part of this uh, forum. Uh, and on the left, we have ATL one. So they were the first four customers, I guess, to be integrated into their pods. We, we flew two more satellites, the unicorns as well. Um, but essentially, um, we had an integration day uh, last year. Uh, I think it was September. And then, um, so it was about three months after that, the spacecraft were deployed in orbit, um, which was really cool. Um, and uh, I think all of them, I think three out of four of them worked perfectly. So, or, or, or very well. Uh, so that was really cool to see. Um, you can tell from Albopod, so like, like I sort of described earlier, Albopod's very light and we can actually, we can take off the back so we can get a lot of access and um, yeah, it's really exciting. Um, so, yeah. These were the other two spacecraft we built. Uh, or we, we launched. So there was essentially two pods on, um, there's two pods on Electron. Um, one was the 1Ps and, and 2P. And we actually had one other customer who didn't make it. So we had the Spacer. So there was supposed to be, that was supposed to be a full pod, but we were, were one short in the end. So we, we flew a sort of special Spacer payload with some, some hidden secret stuff on that. So that was pretty fun. Uh, but this is the team that built Unicorn um, and uh, relatively small team as a satellite team goes, obviously compared to most Polcube teams, maybe quite quite big. And obviously we're a full-time professional company. Um, and yeah, essentially Unicorn, um, the, I think the defining feature of Unicorn is, is its huge wings. You know, it's um, really designed around creating lots of power uh, for people. Uh, that's really what the customers care about. Um, they want power to run their payloads, and if they don't have the power to run their payload, they're not happy. Um, so, um, so we designed it with that in mind. We generate approximately or pretty close to 20 watts uh, peak um, end of uh, beginning of life, um, which is is really good for a, a pod cube. I think the closest to that would be you know maybe a watt or two. Uh, maybe, I don't think there's any other pod cube in the world that's got above two watt peak. Um, 
to my knowledge. Um, I think probably one one watt, one one a bit watts is kind of everyone else. And we're up at, at twenty, obviously. So it's you know twenty x more power, um, which is really useful. And that really allows us to drive the ADCS system and, and reaction wheels and torque rods and run a lot of the kind of like spend the year parts when it comes to a power budget, which um, I also have a lot like leftover power for the payloads, which is really the main thing. Um, yeah. Um. <clears throat> so um, this was us at Rocket Lab HQ, or not Rocket Lab HQ, Rocket Lab Mahia. So um, yeah, essentially, um, for those unfamiliar, Rocket Labs are a um, small launch vehicle company based in New Zealand. Albeit they have, they're very tied to the U.S. They have a, you know, they're essentially headquartered in the U.S. but started in New Zealand and have a lot of ties to New Zealand. So they're sort of a, you know, New Zealand company that kind of is also American. It's kind of weird combo. Uh, but anyway, they, they've they're the first uh, successful uh, small launch vehicle company to make orbit. Um, so we were on flight ten, uh, which was called running out of fingers. Um, so running out of fingers is basically, um, you know, they get, they give each flight like a name and they sort of, you know, uh, try and, uh, come up with something funny. So, um, we were flight 10, so we were running out of fingers. Um, so on that picture there, you can see, um, this is what they call the kick stage, although they're trying to rebrand it as photon and it's kind of unclear exactly where kick stage ends and photon starts, but essentially that's, it's the third stage of the electron rocket. Um, and it's got propulsion, um, it's got a sequencer on board. So essentially um, we flew um, on this kick stage. We put two album pods on that. Um, they have a, a, another payload. So we weren't the biggest payloads. We had six out of seven satellites on that launch. So we had the majority of satellites, um, but we were by far s smaller than the, the Prime, which was a, a microsat called AL2 from uh, Astro Life Experiences in Japan. Um, so super interesting prime. Um, and uh, they, they essentially sat in the middle there. I don't know if we have any pictures of it. I don't think we do. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, um, we, we mounted both the pods on those plates. And um, yeah, um, they obviously went to orbit. Um, this is us down actually in New Zealand. So um, that room you've seen there is actually in the hangar, is what they call it, for Electron. Um, so they have dedicated payload processing facilities on site. So we went out to New Zealand, which is pretty much as far as you can go from Glasgow. Um, we're literally like the opposite side of the planet. So that causes some challenges. Um, and we took a crew out there uh, to help get integration. And um, essentially behind us there is the, um, the launch platform. So if you've seen our launch before, they essentially roll Electron out uh, by hand and then they, they mount it to the um, the strong back and they, they lift it up. So we were um, we were working in and around there and it's like quite a really, really remote place, really hard to get to, uh, which is, I guess, ideal for rockets, but um, really beautiful place. And we were there in November, which was their summer, I guess, um, being in the Southern Hemisphere, not the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, we just had like a lot of, you know, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of good lessons learned from being out there and, and going through the whole launch campaign was really, really interesting. And, you know, how do you get your satellites to the other side of the planet and all the sort of challenges that, that you know, comes with and, um, you know, just making sure everything's integrated correctly that, you know, we, we, we'd done a lot of testing on the kick stage before it flew. So we had a really high degree of confidence. Uh, that we would be able to fire okay, and we'd obviously tested everything and qualified the pods. So um, it was obviously uh, quite a big milestone, and it's really important for the community, in my opinion, just to fly. I think there's a lot of kind of, you know, energy directed towards maybe you know, unproven launch vehicles, and it, we certainly fell into that trap. And I think like going on a flight-proven launch vehicle is like the obvious way to go, and it costs a lot of money, but I think it's kind of the way to go if if we want to demonstrate um reliability from a kind of launch perspective and, and that ultimately i think is what's going to drive the community forward a lot is um dependable launch on flight proven rockets at affordable prices you know that's really what we're we're pushing for um let's see if this works it should work 
Mm. Yeah, so this is basically the video of what I was describing. Um, so that's us, um, as, as described, that's ale, so that's the, the prime. Uh, so that's sat on top of us. This is electron being erected into the correct position. So we're we're at the top of that, um, and uh, yeah, uh, obviously it's sunset. So like we actually launched into what's called an eight eight thirty LTDN orbit. Eight, nine, um, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I'm not sure if you can hear the audio. Oh, we can hear you. Yeah, cool. So this was the launch, essentially. So this was um, on the 6th of December uh, last year. Um, so we had, we had a, a big party at Alba that day. Uh, it was very early in the morning in the UK. I think it's like 8, 8.20 in the morning or something. So it's... Heracles, Rocket Lab's 10th Electron has now left the pad and is on its way to space. With over a million horsepower added back, running out of fingers will quickly reach the toughest point in its HP battle against battery the battery moment off. known as maximum aerodynamic pressure or max. So let's check in on Electron's performance. Which I'm on to. So yeah, so this was like quite a big flight for Rocket Lab in the sense that they um, they were testing a lot of recovery uh, stuff on electrons. We actually got to see a lot of that stuff, which is pretty cool. And we got the tour of the booster, and we got to see all the the stuff they added. So that was that was pretty funky. Um, and it was actually the first time they ga they guided it through the atmosphere. Um, it was a flawless flight from booster perspective. So yeah, it only took about, I think, nine. On the left, we have visual of stage one during its first controlled re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. The data we receive from this guided re-entry will aid in our future recovery plans. We'll continue to broadcast this view as long stage as we can. Three, three, so it only takes about nine and a half minutes to get into orbit or something like that, once, once you light the rocket. As you just heard, we've had successful battery hot swap. Electron's second stage engine continues to burn six minutes and 45 seconds into the mission. So this is the, the video from orbit. So at this point, we're in orbit. Um, so that was quite a, quite a big moment for us, to be honest. Um, it's a company we'd never actually made orbit until that point. And to make orbit with six spacecraft and our own deployers and then two spacecraft we built and, and two platform uh, two payloads was you know not the ideal way to make orbit usually people start with like one satellite and or one component and they build it up but we kind of started with you know quite a crazy cra crazy launch um and uh fortunately it was it's all pretty successful so um so yeah that's really hopefully opened up space now for the Pokemon community to start to fly stuff uh, more regularly, um, which is really kind of what it's all about in our opinion. Um, yeah, um, so that was really, this is a, a time lapse of that launch. Um, I'm not sure what other sides I've got here. Um, yeah, so that was 2019 achievements, I guess. Um, you know, moving forward, um, we we're working on the next launch cluster, so Alba Cluster Three. Um, so that's something that we're, you know, we're, we're pretty close to announcing a lot of news on that front, um, and it'll be all very exciting news for the community. We're currently scheduled for Q4 2020. We're all currently on track for that. Uh, so that will be the the biggest launch in, in Pocky history, um, which is it's really exciting, really, uh, in my opinion. It's um, yeah, it's really, really going to be huge. Um, so it's, it's, I think we've already said, but it's going to be the first double digit Pocube launch, most likely. Um, 
So we're uh, really excited about that. So we've taken you know at least ten satellites to orbit, uh, assuming they'll show up. Um, and it really, I think, sort of validates the uh, the sort of the, the cluster two that we say, well, you know, we said we're going to launch these satellites for people, and and obviously we did. And now you know people can start to rely and trust on Alba launch to get them to orbit. Um, and we've demonstrated Unicorn as well. Um, so really, it's exciting times at Alba to to kick on. Um, something that I don't think I've really got on any of the slides, but we, we've also opened up our own ground station. Uh, so we'll be making more announcements in, in that front in the next few weeks. Um, but we have now our, our fully autonomous ground station that's operational, um, or essentially, is essentially uh, operational, um, pending uh, final location. So it'll be a, a, it a trailer, basically, uh, so we can relocate that. So we're going to move that out to Germany uh, to be part of our, our German entity. Um, so that's going to do a final checkout uh, testing just now. Um, so that's really cool. And uh, completely autonomous, runs off its own uh, solar power, has batteries, has um, 3G backhaul, 4G backhaul. Um, so you can drive it remotely. Um, so it's really, really, I think, going to be a really important product for us moving forward. Uh, something we're really excited about Alpa is the ground station solution and hopefully it'll be like nothing else that's ever really been in that market and uh, yeah um, um, yeah so I'm kind of coming to the end of the slides now at this point um, so um, hopefully that's given you kind of a gist of, of what we've done so far uh, and kind of what we're all about I mean we're, we're all about buck cubes and launching we can get people in orbit for 25k euro which is the lowest commercially available price we list our prices you know we we don't we don't do deals um is what it is um and we're now proven in that we're the the lowest cost orbital the lowest cost way lowest lowest flight proven solution if you want to get a satellite in orbit essentially which it, for us is like quite a big deal because we want to open up space to to new actors and build cool stuff in orbit um because obviously historically space is very expensive and very hard to do. So, um, so yeah, um, our goals for 2020, uh, it's always tricky to know what goals to set ourselves. You know, obviously last year was a bit of a crazy year um, for many reasons, but in particular, obviously, you know, once we get six spacecraft to orbit and two unicorns, you know, where do we go from there? Um, so really we set this internal goal to try and get an image down from orbit. No one's ever done that on a Paul cube before. That's quite a big moment in our opinion for the community. And we also think that that could potentially be a, a useful uh, business opportunity for, um, you know, Paul cubes to, to do sort of niche imaging, uh, go after niche, da uh, niche imaging data sets that should maybe are somewhat overlooked or, or, you know, not worthwhile for a bigger platform to, to go look at, but maybe, a capable Paul cube can maybe, or a couple of Paul cubes could maybe start to target like really kind of, you know, niche applications there. So um, with Alba Connect coming online, uh, with Alba Pod proven, with Unicorn proven, um, and um, you know, really then at that point it's just basically of getting our license sorted, um, which is something that is currently going through the process with the ITU. Um, we're we're really in a good place, I think, to 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 try and make this happen. And and we may not make it this year, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that we'll have a good good go at it. And if not, we'll, we'll learn from it and we'll, we'll soldier on and we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's quite an exciting future, I think. So uh, this is some of the ground station stuff, actually. I kind of forgot I'd uh, left this in. Um, So this is like a really early test of um, it's a really early test of the setup. So we have a S band dish and we have a Yagi. It's actually like our old Yagi. We have a new Yagi that's um, a little bit bigger. Um, this was some early testing we done um, just around Glasgow, uh, just to test out the rotors and uh just so the uh, control uh, control of that um so we're able to demonstrate um that we could slow um that we could um uh set the thing up you know quite quickly in a new location um so this was before we got the trailer uh so the trailer has really allowed us to 
increase the flexibility and, and this was running off um, like a generator but the new version actually runs completely off solar uh, and that's been operational now for some time and um, we have about a kilowatt of storage on the ground station um, we generate uh, I think the panels are 300 watt uh, panels we have total three, uh, three times 100 panels um, we have uh, 4G backhaul um, which um, is really great. So we can we can dial in and, and, and talk to the ground station. Um, and we have like a lot of redundancy and things as well. So we're just sort of like uh, going through the checkout phase on that. And we'll probably be selling this uh, as like kind of solution to people. So people could like buy an Apple Connect ground station or also part of Unicorn that we will operate our own ground station in Germany. That will be the kind of default uh, ground station for the Unicorn customers should they wish to Buy that package um so that's all quite exciting i think um and yeah i'd say like stay tuned for more news on that front i think that's really going to be sort of an important product for us and and it's, it's quite a cool solution now and um yeah we'll see how it goes so yeah that's, that's pretty much all i've got um so i think it's about half an hour um so hopefully that's kind of covers most of the boxes um Obviously, if you have questions and stuff, then I'm happy to, to answer. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity, I guess, to chat about what we're up to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for such a good presentation, Tom. So thank I you. have a question. So uh, as far as I know, you started with uh, Pocket Cube, um, Pocket Cube Soft, right? So you, uh, you started building soft system and selling soft system. But then what made you shift from uh, building soft system and selling soft system to the launch provider? What made the switch to go from making components and platforms to doing the launch? Yeah, uh, well, we we kind of do both still, I guess. Um, so we, we do have unicorn customers and and we do do hardware for people, and that is probably where most of the guys in the company are employed. Um, but we don't really do individual components anymore. We don't really do sort of you know um, sort of ones and twos. We we kind of just build full systems. Um, I, I think it kind of. People who've been around the pocket community for a while will, will, will know the main problem in the community is lack of launch. Um, I mean, it's a common problem. I mean, Alba would have been so much bigger and more successful had we actually launched in 2016 when we were supposed to. I mean, I would think so, you know. Um, so without solving the launch problem, there really is no community. Um, so it's really the first problem that needs solved. Albeit we spent maybe three or four years trying to build components and trying not to die, which was super hard. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we bought a launch from another company and we kind of realized at some point the penny dropped that, you know, it's not going to happen. Um, I think at this point we're like six years delayed, something like that, um, five, six years, which is just obviously crazy. And they, they didn't seem to really care a lot about for the community um whereas obviously alba's you know all about pocubes that's like in our dna we're we're pocube only yeah and we we don't do other satellites um we don't do cubesats we don't do uh other things you know um we're, we're pocube specific that's our thing um and we want that to be the future um so for it to be the future um if we developed Unicorn 2, see, and there was no way of launching it, it would be a crap product because people would go, well, when can I launch it? And we would go, uh, we don't know. Um, so we kind of it was kind of forced, we kind of forced into the situation um, because it wasn't a good solution in the market. Uh, now I think Alba Launch is a good solution, to be honest. And I think it's now proven. So people are now starting to sign up uh, in, in bigger numbers and trust that, uh, it, like, Going cheap on launch is great, but if you don't fly, it's kind of pointless. Um, so that was kind of the situation we're in, where it's like it has to be both cheap and reliable um, and, and dependable. And um, that didn't really exist or doesn't really exist pre Alpha launch. And we're just trying to demonstrate that we can go back to back annual. Because if we could go annual, then people can start to build stuff knowing that there's a, there's a credible way to launch. Um, and they know what the bar is 25K or 40K or 60K, depending on how big your Pocube is. But significantly cheaper than buying a, a one new cube set and um there's no like a regulatory path and there's a you know a privilege path and there's like tele tracking data now and it's like a lot of things that were just like tricky to get sorted and now they're starting to fall into place and um we just want to be a bus for the community um yeah hope for the answers <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, that answers question. So I have one question from participants. So we have one question from participants. It's from it's by Comsart. Comsart. So the question is how you ensure to avoid collision between different cubesats during injection in orbit. How do we avoid cubesats? collisions? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, we do a lot of modeling, first and foremost. So, I mean, there's really two, or two ways of thinking about it. There's uh, intrapod collisions, and there's like collisions between pods. Um, so, on something like Electron, um, we we had six out of seven satellites, um, and as you can see from the uh, the slides. Uh, we actually, they, they, there are different sides of this, the rocket. So one, one point's one way, one point's the other way. So obviously collisions between pods is like super unlikely. Uh, and that's like all really easy to figure out. Um, certainly within the pods, um, there definitely is a weakness in the, the Paul cube standard around um, separation between the Paul cubes. Uh, and that's something that we've brought up like numbers of times with the community. And, and we run the annual Paul cube workshop in, in Glasgow now, and that's, often something that's discussed. Um, the reality is that we, we simulate a lot of these things and there is a chance that like two 1Ps could recollide um, on orbit. Um, but this is mostly within the first maybe 20 seconds of ejection. And if they do touch again, the impact force is probably really small. Um, so until the standard is upgraded to accommodate these types of things, then uh, you know, we just had to sort of go with it. And of the POCUS we launched that were one piece or two piece, like three out of four of them worked. So whatever happened within the first sort of 10, 20 seconds of flight, um, it uh, wasn't enough to uh, stop three out of four of the satellites working, uh, which is, I guess, good. Um, and th there is a kind of second question, which I think is maybe something that maybe some of the customers like Julian and, and the Hungarian uh, team can maybe answer and, and Tracy is, there wasn't a huge spread initially. So it took a long time for the Paul cubes to spread out, um, which in the end they eventually did. Um, but um, it really kind of depends what you're trying to do. Um, so some Paul cubes like the unicorns have very different ballistic coefficients to the, um, the one piece. So like they basically start doing really different things in orbit. So you can spot them a mile away. Um, the one piece, if they're the same shape and they're the same mass, then and they have no force really to sp split them out. They, they tend to not drift that much. Um, over the longer term, they do start to drift, but um, I mean, we just have to kind of work around it. It's not the end of the world, to be honest. It's just kind of like, well, what does that mean and how do we handle it? And if people want to start sticking drag deployables and change their ballistic coefficient, then that's maybe the way to go, like what we do with Unicorn. Um, yeah. Okay, so I have one more question. So do you plan to provide launch facilities to uh, CubeSats or, or any other satellite rather than PocketCube? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's, there's there a lot of good companies that are already. I mean, like, like, we went to talk to all the CubeSat um, launch brokers and we said, can you just sell us a launch for a Paul Cube? And they all told us no. So um, so like there, there's lots of great options if you want to launch a CubeSat. There's not no lack of, of solutions. Um, I think for Paul Cubes, there's not a lot of great options. Um, so that's the market we're in. Okay, so I have one more question. So like, as you see right now in Pocket Cube community, we didn't have a concrete standard for pocket cube. So how do you plan to achieve this or uh, solve this issue? Um, the, the, so the pocket cube standard is now published. So we, between Alba, Gauss and Delft, we published a standard in, I think, mid-2018. Um, so that was the first, I think, public standard that everyone agreed was the standards. They were previously earlier attempts at standards, which then changed and then there was NDAs and it all got kind of weird. So we can add the sort of three party talks between Alba, Gauss and Delft and, and we kind of agreed what a pocket was from a dimensional, like a really basic low level. These are the dimensions and this is the interface. And there's a lot of stuff that maybe wasn't fleshed out, like separation mechanisms and things like that, that we said, well, we just want to get something out there that people can start building in confidence. And really, um, I mean, we, Alba publishes or has published on our website the standards. So if you want to go and check out the standard, go to alborbital forward slash launch. 
uh, if you want to check out the Alba Pod ICD, that's also on that page. So we have both the standard and the ICD. Um, so obviously, from the standards, um, people might um, deviate on their pods uh, somewhat, but ours is um, ours is out there for people to read. Um, the cool thing about Alba Pod is we have very big envelopes. We really love our big deployables. We think that's really the way that pod cubes will be uh, become more capable over time. So we're, we're really big into the deployables and we were the first, I think, organization ever to deploy a quadruple deployable solar panel, um, like either CubeSat or, or PodCube. Or I, I think it's only maybe up to like Dragon or something. I, I've not really seen any quadruple deployables on, on, on microsats or, or CubeSats. So we may actually be the first like, under a ton or something to do that. I don't know. It's, I've not seen many um, or any really. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, so yeah. So is there any chance that you open source uh, your designs sometime <laughs> in the future? Um, well, I mean, like, we're not like super against open source. We're just not like super religious about open source. I mean, I think there's like a difference, you know, I think like open source is cool in the right place. It's like, yeah. but it's not the answer to every problem all the time. Um, yeah. And I think people just need to remember that, you know, it's like, Pocube is an open source standard. And like we are a company who uses that, you know, we have, you know, an open source ICD for that. And that's cool. We have actually, we've actually published in the last week or two, like the, um, the ICD for Unicorn. So that's all open. So we're probably the first commercial Sally company to have a, a an open source or open ICD. Um, I, I'm not aware of any other players to do that. Um, we're really, really open about that. Um, would we ever open source uh, stuff under the hood on Unicorn? Um, probably not, um, unless there's a really good reason to. Um, yeah, I mean, like sometimes it can make sense. I think our difference, I think the problem for us is like, we're trying to, you know, run a business and like, um, yeah. so we got to balance the kind of like, everything should be free and open and how do you pay people? So obviously yeah. like, um, if, you know, who's going to give us money to develop stuff if we then just publish it? Like that's like kind of hard argument you know, so maybe in the future, when you are way forward, then you could, you know, release the previous designs or something like that. That might be done. Yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, like open source and Unicorn 1 would probably like help a lot of teams. Um, whether it's really like, the problem is like then, like you need to do documentation to a certain standard and there's like a lot of work that goes into just like, you know, yeah. even though we have the design, like, you know, it's an internal design and it's like got some maybe things aren't so pretty on it and you know it's, it's not really been designed for external consumption it's designed to be you know an early prototype essentially mm -hmm. um so yeah potentially we could release older versions as we develop the new version yeah certainly when i think unicorn 3 comes around then that will really supersede um unicorn 2 uh, mm -hmm. a lot um so we're not really sure when that will happen but um yeah, I would say we're, as a space company goes, we're probably one of the more open ones. Uh, we're probably not open compared to most people in the community. Um, mm. But I would say like the PogCube community is kind of an anomaly in the space world, you know, when it comes to open source, like the level of adoption. That that's a, can be a good thing, you know, it's not like it's good or bad. It's just, um, yeah. I, I think the other thing that Alba is maybe good at that maybe other space companies aren't is that we're just really open in terms of communication relative to most space companies, you know, we take part in all the forums, we we host the workshop, we invite everyone to come to that. And we share like, you know, we have open houses so people can come and hang out at, um, in Glasgow at the open house for the workshop. So people can kind of come around, hang out in a lab, see spacecraft or go into orbit. And I'm not sure like any other space company does that. So I'd say like, we're not like religious about open source, but we're also not like super anti open source. We just kind of like, we treat it like a tool you use it for the right job and like not every yeah. doesn't solve every problem but also being super proprietary about everything doesn't help with the community either so it's like that balance you know that's how yeah. we're trying to walk the line so um yeah so what about your yeah, plan tom? or okay hey um mm -hmm. sorry yeah. uh tom like uh, i would like to know the challenges uh in launching these pocket cubes like one of the factor was the size right yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you put some light on? Yeah. I mean, I think last year took a few years off my life, maybe a decade off my life. It was pretty stressful. Uh, all the things that happened. Um, 
Yeah. Um, so in terms of like the size and tracking, so like um, it's sort of like pe- the, the main problem outside the pocket world is kind of people who think they can't be tracked, which um, if we're true would be, you know, a bad thing. Um, but obviously that's not true because um, we have the engineering data that says that that's not true. Um, so it's really, the problem we have is more a perception problem. Like, so people don't think they can be tracked, which if enough people think that it's a problem because even if it's not true, because then you need to tell them, oh no, you're wrong. Um, and here's why you're wrong. So, I mean, it was literally, I mean, probably one of the craziest moments of my life was basically like two or three days before launch. Um, like the, um, the launch license was being held up by uh, FAA and uh I think they just realized we we're flying pocket cubes and they're like, what the hell is this? You know, and like it set off a bunch of alarm bells in different government departments. They're like, what the hell are these things? Um, we just thought they were CubeSats and like, they're not actually CubeSats. And it seemed like no one had read the actual license from the, you know, it was kind of a very last minute, oh crap, what are these things? And they're already integrated on the rocket and they're about to go to space. You know, they're in the hangar, they're encapsulated. It's going to be very difficult to take them off. So we had, you know, we had a lot of drama there. And we essentially had to convince NASA and the DOD that they were wrong, um, which was not easy because um, NASA tends to think they're right because uh, they've obviously done a lot of cool stuff. And, um, you know, it's like, well, here's the engineering data. And they were sort of arguing, they kind of like, well, we don't think they can be tracked. It's like, well, look at the data. We sent you the spreadsheet. Here's the tea leaves. And in the end, we had to do like a, a number of things. We had to spend quite a lot of money, to be honest, to try and make the pockets fly. We had to commission reports we had to do a lot of handholding a lot of there's a lot of stuff went into it to get them comfortable um but thankfully they they signed it off and there's really a lot of drama um and um obviously pockets went in orbit and um I, I think the the main game plan for the community should be really just focusing on the tealies and um the trackability um we're also really fortunate in that um Space Fence came online. So Space Fence is their new, the Air Force's billion dollar radar. So that happened to come online just about the time we were launching, which was just luck, I guess, more than anything. And and that really helped a lot um, pick up the uh, the Paul Cubes. Um, I mean, really the issue is the One Piece. Like the, the ones bigger than One Piece, they don't really seem to care too much, but it's really One Piece. Um, and really the problem with One Piece, it seems is that if your antenna doesn't deploy, then you're very hard to see. Um, so it's really, that seems to be the threshold. Um, not impossible to see, because we've seen Fozza and Tracy and, and they don't have their antennas out. Um, but um, certainly that's something we're sort of considering about how we maybe modify things um, to, you know, could we look at potentially dragging, drag deploying um, some of the 1P antennas so that they could definitely deploy and then they'll look bigger on radar or, what, what can we do, you know, to, to help that? Because obviously, worst case scenario, people deploy, they don't build up for some reason, they're a brick. Essentially, you're tracking a five centimeter object. Um, and if you're on the UHF or S-band radar, then um, a, a monopole or a dipole makes you look a lot bigger, much like a stealth fighter looks really small on radar. Like the, you can make your radar cross section much bigger than your actual size if you reflect the energy in the right way. And, uh, uh, a big piece of metal at the right length for that wavelength is a great way to make yourself look big. Um, so that's kind of like the dilemma we have just now. I mean, I think like, or I'm hopeful now that now we've got 16,000 TLEs or something like that, that um, there'll be more support. But obviously the more the pockets fly, the more TLEs are generated, the more people get comfortable with the concept, the more we can create, you know, papers and stuff and, and create awareness that actually pockets are trackable. I think that's really the goal. And this year, hopefully, um, if Cluster 3 goes well, then there'll be another 10 objects out there that um, will be trackable and, and show up on radar. So that'd be really good. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for your like uh, effort, because um, the first time it was really difficult, right? Uh, now you have proven that we can detect, the uh, radar can detect it. But still, like, do you think uh, we will face this problem again when we when we go for the next launch or do you think the topic is closed um, like fcc yeah i don't know um i mean I, <laughs> I, it's like i mean i would hope it's closed um but i mean given our luck it probably won't be um i mean 
the good thing is that going into it this time, we have um, we have more data. I think like engineers kind of can't argue with you when you have data. Like that's kind of like the ultimate way to win an argument with an engineer is data. And um, the the more data we have, um, the stronger argument should be. Um, and like I think they have legitimate concerns. I mean, if you're operating the ISS and you think you can't see the objects and there's humans on board, it's like you're right to be kind of be nervous. I mean, like it's not like that's an unreasonable position. I guess our problem is mostly just trying to demonstrate the trackability and, and potentially even the error bars on that tracking, so that we can say that you know what's the actual uncertainty. And that's something. I mean, I think maybe people in the community could maybe look at is something that would be really useful is the um, the uncertainty in the TLEs and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, I, I don't think it's a done deal um, that, you know, um, we're not going to have issues. But that being said, um, I think we demonstrated a way. And hopefully, you know, I, you know, essentially launching a year after that with, you know, another three or 4,000 TLEs, um, all the Pogsham showed up on radar, all the fears were sort of misplaced, and we could demonstrate that. I mean, the trick is going to be going to higher orbits, uh, and that's kind of something we're going to run into in cluster three. Is like, how, what's the feeling above ISS? You know, that's really, that's going to be tricky. Um, but they can be tracked, so we we'll see, we we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, I don't think it's done deal, but I think it's getting pretty close at this point. Um, we still need to demonstrate that FCC will license one P's. FCC demonstrated that they would license a three P. And that was great. So that's the first uh, pod cube that had been licensed post swarm uh, and that whole incident. Uh, so that was really great that the two unicorns were licensed, but um, we haven't got any one or two P's to US yet. Um, and there's not really been any sort of people that have, have, have went through the full process. So we've got Stanford and Carnegie Mellon going through the process in the US just now. So hopefully they will be seen favorably and the data from cluster two will be really useful in that argument to say, well, you know, if, if this, this Spain and Hungary and, and Germany can fly one piece and why can't the US fly one piece? You know, US likes to be number one. They don't like to be told that they're behind Spain, Germany and, and Hungary. That would, that's not really the way they, they like to operate in space. So, uh, so we'll see. Okay, and my next question would be, I mean, we are attracted to pocket because of the cheaper launch cost. Yep. But if you compare uh, unit cost or the cost per mass, it comes to be expensive compared to CubeSat. And I find it uh, sometimes difficult to uh, convince other people who are building CubeSat come over pocket cube because, uh, you know, it, it's cheaper, but per, per mass, it yep. will be quite expensive. And uh, like, why is it so? Uh, and can we make it cheaper? Yeah, um, I mean, there's like different ways of viewing it. It kind of depends like how your program's set up and like, do you cost your time and things like that? I mean, I think what's cool about PolCube is that if you have 30 grand, you can put a satellite in orbit. Obviously, if you, like, it's like buying a car, right? It's a bit like saying, well, if I had a hundred grand, I could buy a Bugatti. So therefore, why would I buy a Ford Focus? You know, it's like, well, if you don't have a hundred grand, you have no car. <laughs> so it's like really like in my mind, it's like all the people that are flying pockets today probably would never be flying satellites. Really, like I wouldn't be flying satellites. A lot of other people wouldn't be flying satellites. It's not like certainly like in the hobbyist amateur university world, the alternative is not fly. Um, whereas if you already have funding for a cube, I, another thing that really winds me up with this is um, people who build cube sets never fly them. It's just like, well, what's the point in that? You know, it's like, what's the point in spend? Like, don't you value your time? It's like, how many days, weeks, months, years of your time do you spend doing a paper project? It's like, what's the point in that? You know, like, it's like, oh, well, we don't have 300K to launch our three year or six year. It's like, well, why don't you pick something you can actually afford to fly? Like, could you essentially just spend all your time doing a paper exercise and at the end of it, you got a piece of paper. Whereas if you build a polycube, it's an orbit. So it's like, well, you learn so much more by flying something than you do by talking about it or dreaming about it. So like, for me, it's just like, I'm quite pragmatic and I just want to get stuff done. And the number of people who have ideas for satellites and the people who have started a CubeSat and the number of people who've actually flown, there's like a great funnel 
I know right, people have flown CubeSats there and they are a lot of CubeSats, but if you look at the numbers, they're largely driven around like Planet Labs, Inspire, and the big boys. Um, so there's a lot of people not flying stuff. There's a lot of people who are like endlessly delayed. There's a lot of people who will never seriously get to orbit. Like, like case in point, chipsets. You know, like people bought these cheap, cheap chipset kits and, and they still haven't flown. And they're like, oh well, it's like a lot cheaper than Pocube. It's like, yeah, but you're never gonna fly. So you know, what's what's the point in that? You know. Um, so I think for us, that's why we're saying like we want to just sort of hit on the there's a path to orbit. It's proven and low cost and. Um, for me, the, the way that a lot of the funding works, so obviously I run a company and what people want to see, when people give you money, they want to see that it's going to be spent in the right way and that you're going to get stuff done. Like people aren't going to give you money if they think you're going to waste it. So for a lot of people, if they could get their 1P on orbit and say, hey, I got 1P in orbit, like say Julian. Julian went from, you know, chatting to me or like a year and a half ago to having a satellite in orbit, you know, a year later. And, you know, Certainly, he made a lot of good moves, and I also told him to avoid certain things, like you know, don't do chipsets because they won't be trackable and you won't get licensed, and just kind of steer people right down the right path. So then they're in a position then to say, well, hey, I actually flew a satellite. Let's go, go and try and get some more money. Front position of, I've got working satellite in orbit, or I've demonstrated that I'm capable to do X. And like, had it just been a paper project, it probably would have never flown. It would have never went anywhere. If it's going to be like a two year cubesat, you'd have to get like three, four hundred k wouldn't that have happened and um you know um if you reduce the barrier you get flying and if people want to go and do a 1p 2p then go build the cubesat then that's great but for me it's more uh it's you know done is better than you know done is better than perfect it's like just 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 fly stuff you know um and, and if people are getting cubesat launches then fair play to them you know like if, if they're flying it and it works then that's great you know um i think it's more the people that aspire to do it but don't it's kind of the people that kind of frustrate me um or the ones that bank on a free launch um you can't really bank on a free launch it's just like not a good idea um yeah it's just okay total, yeah yeah I, i've you. been around long enough to like yeah yeah <laughs> okay thank you i uh, give it to Saurabh now yeah, so we have come to an end, I guess. So it's almost one hour. Oh. So thank you for your presentation. It was really, really informative uh, presentation. So yeah, thank you very much again. So I, I'll just no stop the recording.